So we begin here at Zechariah chapter 7. Here begins the reading of God's word. On December 8th of the fourth year of King Darius' reign, another message came to Zechariah from the Lord. The people of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regimelech among, along with their men. Regimelech is the only time you will see this name or this word in Scripture. There are some that argue that it's speaking of one and the same person, that it actually means an officer or a friend of the king. So some would suggest that uh, Sherezer is re the Remimelech. He is the one who is the officer or friend of the king. And then there are others who suggest, no, we're talking about two different people. But whatever the case may be, it does not take away from the understanding of the text that the people of Israel, uh, Bethel had sent Sherezer and Remimelech along with their men to seek the Lord's favor. They were to ask this question to the prophets and the priests of the temple of the Lord Almighty. Should we continue to mourn and fast each summer of the anniversary of the temple's destruction as we have done for so many years? And the Lord Almighty sent me this message. This is Zechariah speaking. Say to all the people and to your priests, during those 70 years of exile, while you fasted and mourned in the summer and at the festival, in early autumn, was it really for me that you were fasting? Verse 6, and even now, in your holy festivals, you don't think about me, but only about pleasing yourselves. Isn't this the same message the Lord proclaimed to the prophets years ago when Jerusalem and the towns of Judah were bustling with people, and the Negev and the foothills of Judah were populated areas? Then this message came to Zechariah from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says, judge fairly. And honestly, show mercy and kindness to one another. Do not oppress widows, orphans, foreigners, and poor people. And do not make evil plans to harm each other. Your ancestors would not listen to this message. They turned stubbornly away and put their fingers in their ears to keep from hearing. They made their hearts as hard as stone. One translation says as hard as a diamond. So that they could not hear the law. Of the message, the messages that the Lord Almighty had sent them by his spirit through the earlier prophets. That is why the Lord Almighty was so angry with them. Since they refused to listen, when I called to them, here's God speaking, I would not listen when they called to me, says the Lord Almighty. I scattered them as with a whirlwind among the distant nations where they lived as strangers. Their land became so desolate that no one even traveled through it. The land that had been so pleasant became a desert. So far the reading of God's word. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you again for this, your beloved, my dear ones that have gathered here. It is always a privilege to stand before them. Now would you give us clarity of thought, continuity of thinking, accuracy of the text. Help your servant to teach in such a way that even a child amongst us would be able to embrace the powerful revelation and truth that is given to us through the text. And Lord, you know always, I will do nothing but give you all of the praise, all of the adoration. You, sir, shall be lifted up high. We love you and we bless you. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's people shout amen. 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 You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We're continuing our teaching as stated in the book of Zechariah. We're going to look at a people who in essence are now returning back from exile. They're coming back and their first responsibility, that which they first seek to do, is to rebuild the temple that had been destroyed. For you see, it is the temple that signifies the presence of God among his people. So this was a top priority that they had. But as with many projects, uh, it, there, there was a delay. There was a little struggle with it. It was not moving as fast as they had anticipated that it would move. We were blessed for the last two weeks by uh, the, the beautiful teaching ministry of Pastor Brian Kiley that set the introduction to us for the book of Zechariah. Has he not blessed us, Pastor Kiley? Has he not blessed us by just laying that out for us? Uh, again, I tell Pastor Brian, he's an extraordinary teacher. I mean, he has a way of just laying some of the most difficult passages, laying it out and helping us to understand it. When we look at the book of Zechariah, we must look at it as we do with most prophetic texts. 
most prophetic texts that we look at, it must be looked at in regards to three lenses. It must be looked at in regards to what it was saying then, what is it saying to us now, and what does it speak of in regards to the future. Whenever we look at prophetic texts or we look at many of the texts that are there in the Old Testament, we find that helps us to be able to apply the scriptures to our lives today. For you see, we are blessed here at Bridgeway. I would even go as far as to say we're a little spoiled because there are many congregations that dare not touch any of the Old Testament scriptures. We've been blessed to go through most of the Old Testament here just in our weekend gatherings, being able to look. Our pastor has done, again, a marvelous job in casting vision and helping us to know that it is important that within a biblically illiterate society, we are going forward to learn the Bible, to learn what the Scriptures are saying, both, listen, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Again, there are those who only look at the Old Testament, and then there are another group of brothers and sisters who only embark upon studying the New Testament. But we tend to look at both the old and the new, and we look at the old in light of the new. Because contrary to public opinion, Jesus is not only found through Matthew to Revelation. Jesus is found, how many of you know, all the way back to Genesis, through every book of the Bible, you will see the Lord Jesus Christ manifesting himself towards us. So we are blessed in that regard, and we want to always be a people who approach all of Scripture. For you see it is in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 through 17, that Paul writes these words, all Scripture is breathed out by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. So we want all of the Scripture. And it's with that that Pastor Brian, when he last shared with us, talked about the eight visions that were given to the prophet Zechariah that denoted God's judgment, God's correction, God's interface among his people and revealing his glory. And then Pastor Brian also introduced to us within the introduction of the book of Zechariah the concept or the theme that runs throughout the book, and it is that of restoration. God wanted to restore his people then. He wants to restore his people now, and there will be a time that he will restore all of his people. So again, this was brought out to us and the importance of that. Now, in chapter 7, we push ahead two years later, two years beyond the visions that were given, the eight visions that were given to Zechariah. And we're going to find beginning in chapter 7 that Zechariah is going to present sermons or the word of God. He's going to say, God has given me this word. Here's what he said, and here's what I'm telling you. That's what a sermon is. A sermon is when God speaks to us, to whomever is delivering the sermon, and then we deliver it to the people. That's a sermon. Now, if God's not speaking to the person who's delivering the sermon, then all you're hearing is a talk. Okay? We want to hear, what is the Lord saying? What is God speaking? So that when we go to the scriptures, it's as though the word of God jumps off the pages. And God, through his Holy Spirit, begins to speak to us through his word. That he says things to us. There are things that will never come out of my mouth in the next 35 minutes. There were things I will never say out of my mouth. But between God using me and the Holy Spirit speaking to you, there are some things that you're going to get so that when we all leave here, we will not leave the same way we came. We will walk out of here transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. We might have come in looking like we were baptized in pickle juice, but we're going to leave out of here with rejoicing on our faces. Amen? Glory to God. Because that's the blessing of being able to come together. We come into this house to magnify the Lord and worship him. But then as well as we're worshiping him, he uses brothers and sisters all around us to help encourage us so that we can get back out there and fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Praise the Lord. So we're seeing now how all of this begins to unfold in chapter 7 in which they're continuing to move forward and build the temple. And they're in the process. They're almost finished. But again, there's some discouragement that has set in. And so like us, for them, they're wondering how long is this going to take? 
Uh, where are we at? You know, there are times that you have to just step back and take inventory. You're trying to think about what, where am I at with this now? Where am I at in the process? Uh, especially if you've ever approached things from the standpoint, I thought it would happen a little bit sooner than this. I thought the answer would come a little bit quicker than this. There are times that you almost have to just step back and take some reflection and inventory, and you ask the question, where are we in this process? That's what's going to happen, in which these men will approach the prophets, and they will approach the priests, and Zechariah is amongst them. And Zechariah hears them, and here's the question that they pose to the prophet. They say, how long, here's what they say, they ask, how long will we mourn? How long shall we continue fasting? How long shall we continue to grieve? In other words, we, we have uh, brought out our calendars and we have the list of all of the fasts and the festivals that are practiced among our people, which are tied to a heart of repentance. All of the fasts that we present before God is tied to wanting to hear from the Lord and to repent and, and, and move from disobedience to obedience. So now, man of God, how long shall we continue to mourn? How long shall we continue to fast? And the prophet responds, interesting enough, with this response. And, and I'll, I'll paraphrase for, for you. He responds by saying, well, where, first of all, have you got it? Have you got it? Do, do you understand why you are fasting? Do you understand why you are mourning? You, you know, he, he, he puts it back to them because the question demands an answer, but the answer is right before them, and really they just have to respond to it. It speaks of where is your heart? What has God said to you? Are you being obedient? It is reminiscent to what would be asked, if you recall, by John the baptizer, in which he would send, you remember, his disciples to Jesus and ask the question, are you the one or shall we look for another? In other words, Jesus, we thought you were going to do it like this. We thought you were going to move like this. We thought the timing on this would come quicker. And Jesus, you remember his response? He says, go back and tell John what you have seen and what you have heard. Go back and tell him that the sick are being healed. Go back and tell him that the dead are being raised. In other words, the very thing that he's panicking on, John, the very thing that John the baptizer was getting nervous about, he says, first of all, calm down. Calm down. The question is, are you, not, not, not shall we continue to fast or continue to mourn, but have you got the answer? Have you got the message yet? Do you understand that fasting is not just you saying, I'm not going to do this or I'm not going to eat that. It's kind of like the person I'll never forget every year, every single year, never cease to fail when I was pastoring in Midtown, every single year, we'd go into a time of fasting and prayer, and we'd call the church to a time of fast. Sometimes we'd fast 21 days or what have you, and it never ceased to fail. I'd get at least three people say, can I eat French fries on my fast? <laughs> and I'm like, that really has little to do with fasting. Fasting is not what you give up. Fasting is what you take in. Fasting is taking in the Word of God. Fasting is hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. Fasting is saying, I'm going to turn and reflect on the things of God for a period of time so that I might understand God's heart for me and that I might move continuously in obedience to God. If all you're doing is giving up something to eat, that's not a fast. That's called a diet. <laughs> so they ask the question, how long shall we mourn? I'm reminded of this, and I want to give it to you now. I'm going to give you these five responses to the restoration process. When we are being in a place and moving into a place of total restoration, there are five responses that I think are appropriate to the heart of every believer. Number one, we personify restoration by our service to others. We personify restoration 
by our service to others. You and I will know that we are truly experiencing restoration in our heart by how we begin to serve others around us. Did you catch what the prophet said? The prophet said, the oppressed are their needs being met. The foreigner, the poor, the broken are their needs being met. See, when you are truly been, when you've been restored, it turns the attention off of yourself onto others, caring and ministering for others. A person who has truly been restored and experienced restoration in their life, they become, watch this, less selfish and more selfless. They begin to reach and trying to care. So it's the person who themselves have gone so much brokenness and experienced so much brokenness in their life, but they find themselves being drawn to go to the nursing home and sit with a senior and sit with an elderly person who has no visitors coming in to see them. And you go there every week just to help them by reading a book or by reading the Word of God or praying for them or singing a song or helping to feed them. That, that's the person who has been restored, a person who has been restored in their own lives and has been delivered and set free from the addictions that have uh, taken control of their own heart and now they've been set free. Then God can speak to that person to go to the hospital and hold a baby that, whose mother has been addicted to drugs and that child has been born and has convulsions and they hold that child in their arm and the Holy Spirit in them begins to minister to that baby and they prophesy to that baby. They do what that baby needs by speaking into that baby's life before CPS comes to take that baby into foster care. They proclaim the word of God over that that baby. A person who has been restored goes to the school and seeks to mentor children who can't get math down or who are not able to get English down. A person who has been restored looks for any and every way to serve God because we understand that all the blessings we have in our life has little to do, has nothing to do, to be more honest, has nothing to do with how much money you have in your bank, your status in your community, has nothing to do with your education. It has to do with the fact that God has been good to you. And he gets all of the glory. He gets all of the praise. So again, we personify restoration by our service to others. Number two, we are called to fully embrace restoration. We are called to fully embrace restoration. We must not be passive, beloved. We must be people that are intentional with the belief and the understanding and the activities that reflect that Jesus Christ has restored us and we embrace that fully. Number three. We understand that because we have been restored, we worship the restorer, and our worship of the restorer exemplifies restoration. Let me say that again. Our worship of the Lord Jesus, our worship of the one who restores, exemplifies restoration. And then number four, restoration will allow us to distinguish between what is truth and what is a lie. We'll come back to that in just a moment. When you and I are truly restored into our place and our rightful position in Christ Jesus and our place in God through Christ Jesus, then we understand that we're able to distinguish between what is true and what is a lie. You cannot pull the wool over my eyes. I just know what I know, what I know, what I know. And then number five, restoration acknowledges that the Messiah is coming. Restoration acknowledges, just like for the people of Israel, he fought their battles. It also acknowledges that just like them, he fights our battles. And it also acknowledges that there will be a day. I know you don't hear people preach on it much, but it is the word of God. It is the whole gospel that there will be a day that Jesus Christ, who now sits in a physical body at the right hand of God the Father, he sits at the right hand of God the Father. There will be a day that he will come and break the clouds, and he will come, and those that have died in Christ and who are asleep in Jesus, like my father, like my mother, like my brother, they will awaken from the dead. They will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and those who are alive and remain, they also shall be caught up together with them in the air and forever will we be with the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's some good news right there. Hallelujah. He is coming again. Don't get too comfortable with your house and your little apartment. He is coming again. Hallelujah. And he's coming to receive his church, and there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, and he shall establish his kingdom forever and ever and ever. So again, we 
personify restoration by our service to others. Matthew 6.33 tells us like this, but seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. In other words, beloved, worship while you work. Worship while you work. Seek first the kingdom. The Hebrew mind would state it like this. Seek first God's realm, God's government, God's rule, God's reign. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Again, the Hebrew mind would say his righteous acts or his righteousnesses, plural. His acts of righteousness. Seek first God's rule, his reign, his domain, his, his rulership, and his corresponding acts of righteousness, and all these other things that signify restoration shall be added to you. He will demonstrate those things to you. Let's go now to the next chapter, chapter 8. Here begins his word. Then another message came to me. From the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. My love, my love for Mount Zion is passionate and strong. I am consumed with passion for Jerusalem. And now the Lord says, I'm returning to Mount Zion and I will live in Jerusalem. The, then Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. The mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, all men and women will walk. Jerusalem streets with a cane and sit together in the city squares and the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls at play. Boy, that sounds like a lot of joy going on right there. Sounds like a lot of restoration has happened. This is what the Lord Almighty says. My pastor that I grew up under used to say credibility depends upon who said it. Just because certain people say certain things don't mean it's true. But how many know if God said it, it's true. Credibility depends upon who said it. This is what the Lord says. The Lord Almighty says all this may seem, listen to this, all this may seem impossible to you now. All of this may seem impossible to you now, a small and discouraged remnant of God's people. But do you think this is impossible for me, the Lord Almighty? This is what the Lord Almighty says. You can be sure that I will rescue my people from the east and from the west. I will bring them home again to live safely in Jerusalem. They will be my people, and I will be faithful and just towards them as their God. Verse 9, this is what the Lord Almighty says, take heart and finish the task. Take heart and finish the task. Take heart and finish what I told you to do. That wasn't just a word for them. That's a word for us right now. God says, no matter where the adversary has tried to discourage you, has tried to make you feel confused, has tried to make you doubt, has tried to make you believe that there's no hope for your marriage, has tried to make you believe that your child who has gone astray, that there's no hope, there's no answer, they're just going to be lost. That is what the enemy has led you to believe. But I want to be, if I may, a vessel, a mouthpiece of the Lord in this auditorium this morning to say to the person sitting from the front to the back that whatever the adversary has led you to believe, the devil is a liar. He is a liar. He has told you an untruth. He has told you a story. He is trying to confuse you because he knows that you are on the brink of a breakthrough. He knows that you are on the brink of seeing God do something powerful in your life. And you are the determining factor. If you can yet not throw in the towel. If you can yet say, I believe God, there is an answer and there is a hope for you that is in this auditorium this morning. And I'm telling you, the presence of God is here to bring restoration. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Boy, I feel my help coming now. I thought I was a little tired, but I feel my help here. God is here to do what he said he will do. It may seem impossible to you right now, but nothing is impossible for our God. He is able, 
and he is here to deliver and to set us free. Look what he says. He says in verse 6, once again, this is what the Lord Almighty says. All this may seem impossible to you for now, small remnant and discouraged remnant of God's people. But do you think it's impossible for the Lord Almighty? Do you think I can't handle this? Do you think I don't know what I'm doing? Look down at verse 9. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Take heart and finish the task. After you had everybody pray for you to go back to school, just because you had a 1.6 grade point average last semester does not mean you need to quit. <laughs> you had us pray, now go finish the task. Get yourself enrolled and do what you're supposed to do. You had everybody pray and fast and believe God for you to get that job for the state. Now you went to the state and you're working with some knuckleheads and you're ready to quit a job and you ain't got a job to go to. <laughs> finish the task. Finish the task. Go right back to what God has promised. Some of you, you have children, again, that have gone astray, and you're feeling like there's no answer, there's no hope. I'm here again to tell you, don't give up. Finish the task. Don't quit believing God. Don't quit going in their room while they're going out partying all night and touching their bed and believing God to deliver them and set them free. Get old school with it. Walk through your house and say, Lord, the enemy cannot have my house. The enemy cannot have my family. The enemy the enemy cannot have my husband. The enemy cannot have my wife. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will. Bless God. I've come to too much to give up now. God, you've been too faithful. You've been too good. You've always shown yourself mighty. This is not the first time I felt like my back was against the wall. Every time, do I have a witness here? Every time that my back was against the wall, God, you came through and you made a way where there seemed to be no way. Somebody give God a high praise and bless him in the house. Oh, bless his name. Oh, bless his name. Oh, bless his name. Take heart and finish the task. You have heard what the prophets have been saying from building the temple of the Lord from the beginning. Almighty, the Lord has spoken ever since the foundation was laid. Verse 10, before the work on the temple began, there were no jobs. There were no wages for either people or animals. No traveler was safe from the enemy, for there were enemies on all sides. I had turned everyone against each other. Verse 11, but now, everybody say, but now. I will not treat the remnant of my people as I treated them before, says the Lord Almighty, for I am planting, watch this children, this is for you, I am planting seeds of peace and prosperity among you. The grapevines will be heavy with fruit, my God. The earth will produce its crops and the sky will release its dew. Once more, once more, I will make the remnant of Judah and Israel the heirs of these blessings. Among the nations, Judah and Israel, uh, among the nations, Judah and Israel, you had become symbols of that which means curse, but no longer. Now I will rescue you and make you both a symbol and a source of blessing. Not only will you be blessed, but you will be a blessing. So don't be afraid or discouraged, but instead get on with rebuilding the temple. Touch three people around you and say, get on and do what the Lord told you to do. Go ahead and tell them. Get on and do what the Lord told you to do. Get on about your father's business. Do what God told you to do. Be obedient to God, for this is what the Lord Almighty says. I did not change my mind when your ancestors angered me, and I promised to punish them, says the Lord Almighty. Neither will I change my decision to bless Jerusalem and the people of Judah. So don't be afraid. Verse 16, but this is what you must do. Tell the truth to each other. Render verdicts in your courts that are just, that lead to peace. Do not make evil plots to harm each other. And stop this habit of swearing to things that are false. I hate all of these things, saith the Lord. Here's another message that came to me from the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. The traditional fasts and times of mourning that you have kept in early summer, midsummer, autumn, and winter are now ended. They will become festivals of joy and celebration for the people of Judah. So love truth and peace. Verse 20, this is what the Lord Almighty says. People from nations and cities around the world will travel to Bridgeway. <laughs> the people of our city 
will say to the people in another, let's go to Bridgeway to ask the Lord to bless us and to seek the Lord Almighty. We are planning to go ourselves. Verse 22, people from many nations, even powerful nations, listen church, will come to Bridgeway to seek the Lord Almighty and to ask the Lord to bless them. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 people from nations and languages around the world will clutch at the hem of one Jew's robe and they will say, please, let us walk with you, Bridgeway, for we have heard that God is with you. We have heard that God is with you. See, y'all, I'm not just playing games with you on this. I'm telling you the truth. God has his hand on this house. Are you hearing me? God will use people who are outside these walls, who've been looking at this red brick building and looking at cars pulling up and seeing you leave smiling faces. I hope you leave with smiling faces. They see you leaving and driving off, but now they're going to begin to say, I've got to get over there because the people of God are over there and God is moving in that place. People whose marriages are falling apart will say, I heard that you all believe that God can put marriages back together. I've got to get where you are. I want your God to be my God. There will be people who are drug addicted that will walk the perimeters of this property coming down off a high and just walking past this place as we're praising God in here. They'll be just staggering along the road and say, something's touching me. I feel the power of God coming on me. I'm too close to power. I'm too close to anointing. And it will be the people of God in this house standing up and doing what God has told us to do and be who God has called us to be. Come on and give him a praise here. Oh, bless his name. You need to understand that God didn't call you to just walk into a nice air-conditioned building with nice pretty blue chairs and, and just sit around and drip, uh, drink lattes. We are here to kick devil butt. Do you hear what I'm saying? We are here to see God change and transform lives and deliver people. Touch somebody and say, the power of God is in this room. He's here right now. We must understand children. We must understand there's a reason our pastor has been talking about that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's a reason that we see miracles, signs, and wonders. By default, by default, not even being intentional about it, by default, God does miracles, signs, and wonders and delivers people in this place. There's a reason we're seeing that. What will happen when we know who we are and know who he is, and know who he is in us. What will happen, Bridgeway, when we start hiding and stop hiding and stop drawing back and being timid? What will happen then we, when we begin to say that our God is here to deliver, our God is here to restore, our God is here to set free? What will happen then when we change our countenance and stop looking sad and stop looking depressed and begin to stand on what we believe and know know what we know, what we know, what we know. I'm telling you, God will send deliverance to Roseville. He will send deliverance to Sacramento. He will send deliverance to our nation. He will send deliverance to the earth. He will send deliverance, and it could start right here. My God, I dare you to give God some praise right there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm trying to be nice. I really am. But I feel this thing up in here, y'all. Hallelujah. You play with fire, you might get burned. You understand what I'm saying? Hallelujah. I know that 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 God has got his hand on us. We're not just here by accident. We're not mistakes. We're not just here just doing a social club. We are God's army. We are God's people. We are God's anointed. We are in the kingdom of God. Give God a high praise and bless his name one more time. Go ahead. Oh, I got a rush alone, and that's just point two. We are called to fully embrace 
restoration. James 1, 16 through 17 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. You see, I'm not telling you that the process will not be difficult. Like the children of Israel, it will seem like it's slow. But I have learned, look at me, I have learned that every delay does not mean denial. I have learned, children of God, that it is in the time I've had to wait on God that God has revealed his character the most. When I waited, when it didn't come in a hurry, it was in that time that God taught me some things. I would not have learned some things had it come quickly. But when I had to struggle a little bit, when I had to be challenged a little bit, God used those as an opportunity to draw himself close to me. In fact, maybe you can't say this, I can, but maybe you can't, but it came to a point, I got to a place where I said, Lord, even if you don't do it, even if you don't do it like I want you to do it, you are still good. Uh, <laughs> even if you don't heal the person, you're still good. Even if I don't get the job, you still gonna get some praise. Even if this doesn't happen. See, that's when you learn it's really not about what I want. It's about God, what is going to bring you glory and adoration. What's going to please you? So here's your feeling. My misery has brought about, here's the next word, my ministry. I won't say that slow like we're on Sesame Street. My misery has taught me some things, and it has brought about ministry. See, I don't give the enemy any ground. I don't give him any ground. I, like you, I got stuff going on right now. I got some challenges going on right now, things I'm asking God to do. But I refuse to let the adversary think he's won. Even on my worst day in Christ is better than my best day in the world. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So I don't give the enemy any ground. I, I, I'm going to keep praising. I'm going to keep smiling. I, I love the fact that I've got you encouraging me and I'm in the hallway and we'll say, oh, praise God, I'm praying for you. And I'll say, praise God, I'm praying for you. But how many of you found out there's sometimes you even have to encourage yourself? I still go and look in the mirror and say, boy, you looking good today. You want to go on with your bad self. Go on, boy. The, the, the other day, I was struggling with some things, and I'm saying, God, it's not happening fast enough. Lord, how long have I got to wait on this? How long do I have to struggle with this? And then I said, wait a minute. I'm not going to give the adversary any ground. I'm going to go and do something I've never done before. So I went down to Midtown and plopped myself up on a table, and I got a facial. Cucumbers on my eyes and the whole nine, y'all. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> Brothers, it does work. It's good. It, it, it. It's good. In fact, it was so good, I said, book me in four weeks. <laughs> Don't give the adversary any ground. When you walk out of this place this morning, this afternoon, when you walk through those doors, don't walk out of here with your head hung down and looking all depressed and looking all sad. Look like you have heard a word from the Lord. Act like you have heard a word from the Lord. Talk like you have heard a word from the Lord. Step out and say, well, uh, I heard a word that stirred up my faith. I'm going out and I'm going to believe God is going to bless me with this new house. I'm going to go looking at homes with my credit score of 200 and believe God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of y'all laughing, but some of us are sitting up in here 
in homes we could not afford. We could not have the credit score for it, and God worked a miracle. You, can I give you a little side note, and then I'm going to quit? A little side note. See, when they go back and they have a little dialogue and discussion at the, at the car lot, or they're talking about you, and they're waiting on the loan to come through, that's the time that God is working a miracle on your behalf. I think I got about 30 of y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Let them go and have their little round table and discussion. And while you wait, keep praising God. Yeah. Keep blessing God. Say, Lord, you're a restorer. Lord, you knew I had to file bankruptcy seven years ago, but God, you said you will restore. God, when I went through the divorce, I never thought I'd have to go through this, God. But you said you will restore, God. When I lost my health, God, and I had to quit my job, God, you touched my body, and now I can't get a job, but God, you said you would restore. Get yourself postured into restoration. 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 God keeps his promises. Amen? Amen? Glory to God. Oh, my, my, my. Well, all right. It looks like we're going to have to move on quick note here. So let me just give you this. Then we're going to go because I got myself happy and lost, <laughs> lost track of time. <laughs> Zechariah chapter 9. This is the message from the Lord against the land of Aram and the city of Damascus. For the eyes of all humanity, including the people of Israel, are on the Lord. Doom is certain to Hamath and Damascus, and for the cities of Tyre and Sidon too. Though they are so clever, Tyre, Tyre uh, has built a strong fortress and has piled up much silver and gold, that it is calm and is dust in the streets. Number four, verse four. But now the Lord will strip away Tyre's possessions and hurl its fortifications into the Mediterranean Sea. Tyre will be set on fire and burned to the ground. Here's what God is saying all in chapter 9. I will deal with your enemies. I will fight for you. You don't have to worry. John 12, 15 through 17 says, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. See, that's why we worship the restorer. We worship Jesus because it exemplifies restoration. See, I know that all the time, listen to this, listen to this. While I'm praising God, while I'm blessing God, he is fighting and confusing my enemies. I'm going to help you, Bridgeway. The other three services didn't get this. This is for y'all. You cannot afford to come in here and cross your legs and fold your arms and roll your eyes when worship is going on. When we are lifting our voices and worshiping God, watch what happens. In the spirit realm, it confuses the enemy. I'm going to say it again. Y'all, some of y'all act like you ain't ever heard this. You're looking at me like Alice in Wonderland. Let me help you here. When we collectively lift up our voices or clap our hands or shout to God, in the spirit realm, it confuses the adversary. He doesn't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do when we praise God. He thinks you ought to look sad. He thinks you ought to be walking around with tissue in your hand, looking depressed. But when you make up your mind, I will bless the Lord. At all times, good times, sad times, bad times, I'm going to still bless him. It causes the enemy to turn on himself. My God. Listen, some of y'all are going to get more done in the heavenly realms in one hour and a half and sitting in this church service than you've been struggling with the last three months. Because all it takes is God's people coming together, touching and agreeing. All it takes is God's people coming together and say, oh, no, no, we're going to pull that demon off your back. We're going to let the enemy know he ain't going to take your joy. He's not going to take your peace. He's not going to take your strength. No, he's not going to take your family. Your children will come to know the Lord. Even though they have walked away, they're coming back to God. All it takes is getting in the right atmosphere. That's why I can't sit next to people who aren't praisers. 
I have to sit next to praisers. I can't sit next to people that are just sitting there and say, this is nice. wonder how they put these lights up in here. I got to sit next to people that when they come in here, they come to do business. They come to lift up the name of Jesus, to glorify God, to magnify His name and worship. Hey! Hallelujah. Smile at somebody say, am I sitting next to the right person? Go ahead and ask them. I said, don't make me move my seat now. Don't make me move my seat. <laughs> Hallelujah. Chapter 10. Chapter 10. We're going to have to stop because, whoo, I'm going to have to let Pastor Matt pick up the rest of this. Here we go. Chapter 10. Ask the Lord for rain in the spring, verse 1, and he will give it. It is the Lord who makes storm clouds that drop showers of rain so that every field becomes a lush pasture. Household gods give false advice. Fortune tellers predict only lies. And interpreters of dreams pronounce comfortless falsehoods. That's, that's why I told you all a couple of weeks ago, we don't do horoscopes over here. That was a weak amen. That means you've been dabbling. We don't do... Now about the weekend, say amen. Hey, amen. <laughs> we don't do horoscopes. Amen. You are not an Aries. You are a child of the living God. Amen. So my people are wandering around like lost sheep without a shepherd to protect and guide them. God says in verse 3, my anger burns against you false shepherds and will punish these leaders. For the Lord Almighty has arrived to look after his flock. Look at this. The Lord Almighty has arrived to look after his flock of Judah. He will make them strong and glorious like a proud war horse in battle. From Judah will come the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, all of the rulers. They will be like mighty warriors in battle. That's y'all trampling their enemies in the mud under their feet. Since the Lord is with them as they fought, they will overthrow even the horsemen of the enemy. Amen. That's y'all. See, see, see. That was then. That's now. And that is to come. That's you right now, beloved. You are mighty warriors of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Mighty warriors. Restoration, write this down if you don't have it down already, will distinguish between what is truth and what is a lie. Let me say that again. Restoration will distinguish between what is truth and what is a lie. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, he says, but false prophets arose among the people then, just as there will be false teachers among you now, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing unto themselves swift destruction. See, and when we read that, we must be so careful because most of us will think that, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. He's talking about the Moonies. He's talking about the Mormons. He's talking about that. And yes, but note here more specifically, he says, these will be those who are among you. Those who are among you. It, uh, can I say something? I may get in trouble. Don't care. <laughs> But the real, your real adversary as far as false teaching has little to do with the false teachers that are outside of us, say the Jehovah Witnesses, the, the ones at 10 o'clock yesterday morning you hid from when they rang your doorbell, the Jehovah Witnesses, <laughs> where you told a dog and everybody else, shh, be quiet. Yes. <laughs> That's really not the biggest concern. It's a concern, but it ain't the biggest concern. It's the ones that are secretly among us. Here, go. Now, here, watch what I'm saying. See, I almost envy what the Jehovah Witness, the Moonies, the Mormons, whatever you want to call them, I envy what they are willing to do for a lie, what we who are believers won't even do for the truth.
because you said, say it again. I'm going to say it again. I envy. We talk about, oh, look at this. But I envy the fact that they are willing to do for a lie. What we who say we have the word of God and we are in the kingdom of God, we won't even do for the truth. We won't even go across the street to tell our neighbor about the Lord Jesus. Are you hearing what I'm saying, beloved? Can I tell you the biggest lie that will rise up in this church? Let me get real specific. I'm not even going to go around the corner up the street. I'm going to stay right here. The biggest lie that we will contend with in this church is the belief that God no longer does miracles, signs, and wonders. It is the lie that says he's not healing anymore. He's not delivering people anymore. He's not restoring anymore. That's what he did back then, but he's not doing it now. As much as our pastor may teach it, as much as the others may teach it, and we believe it and we see God doing it, there will be those who yet sit in our seats that will say, I just don't believe that's for us today. (laughs) And that is a trick of the adversary. Because I'm going to tell you something. If you have ever been restored by God, hallelujah, if you've ever been healed in your body, if you've ever seen your family member healed and set free, it will convince you of the fact that indeed he is still working miracles. He is still delivering people. He is still healing people. If you've ever been touched by God, If you have ever been touched by God, you will never settle for the lie that God is not doing that anymore. If you've ever had God put his hand on you in the midnight hour with tears running down your face and the spirit of the Lord tell you everything's going to be all right, you'll never believe someone tell you that God doesn't speak to his people. If you've ever had God turn around and spare you in the middle of a car that was flipped over in the middle of the highway and you walked away and was able to talk about it, you'll never believe that God does not have angels that he releases just in a nick of time and brings you into a place of safety. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? If you've ever, if you've ever been restored, Is there anybody that's restored in this house? If there's anybody in this house that knows about his restoration. Y'all, I got to quit. I'm so happy. I'm about ready to run down Washington. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to stop right there. I'll leave it with this. God is faithful. He's been faithful, he is faithful, and he'll always be faithful. Do you hear me? He's been faithful. He's faithful right now, and he's always going to be faithful. When you walk out of these doors, don't you go out of here with your head hung down. The enemy is under your feet. Come on, take ground, take ground. Take ground every place you put your feet. Claim territory for the Lord Jesus Christ. Declare that I am a victor and not a victim. Hallelujah. Today is the best day of my life because God lives big in me. Hallelujah. My joy is coming back. My peace is coming back. My strength is coming back. I'm ready to do all that God has called me to do. Stand to your feet all over the room.